Hi, Gary Chillingworth here for Air Gunner Magazine Shooting and Country TV. Welcome to Life at the Range. Well, as you can see, we're not actually at the range today. We're here once again at Maldon District Air Gun Club to do our HFT walk around Springer edition. What we're going to do is we're going to have a little mooch around the woods. We're going to shoot a few targets with my lovely TX200 and see how many we can knock down. Don't have a huge amount of wind today. But what we're going to do is we're going to try and put all the things that we've learned over the last couple of months together. Range finding, reading the wind, elevation, and we're going to see what we can do. Um, but also our last video we did on the HW95, which I entitled, sorry, I, I titled Budget Springer. And quite a few people have come to me and said, Gary, it's not really a budget Springer. And that's a fair point. You can get them for about £350, which, you know, is a good price for a very accurate quality rifle. But there are certainly cheaper guns out there. You know, you can get some nice rifles, you know, Gamma Whisper, £150, £160, you know, BSA Meteors. You know, there are lots of other guns. But I don't really know that much about budget, budget springers. So if one of you out there has a budget springer that you can recommend, Something that carries a scope and will shoot a 10p piece size group at 35 40 yards. Can you let me know in the comments below? And we'll see about getting one and doing a real budget piece. As I say, we're here for, for what you guys want. Um, as ever, please like, share, and subscribe. You know, keep Emily from attacking me. Uh, it really is appreciated, helps the algorithm and helps us get these videos made. So, Enough waffle from me, let's go on, let's shoot some targets, and welcome to Life at a Range. Okay, so here we are at our first target. We walk up and we have a look, and it's at the back of the woods. Now, I'm lucky, I know these woods quite well. And I know that I can see peg four there, which is just to our right, has got a target right at the back there. Now that's pretty much in line to where we are. So that target is further away than this target. Now I, I'm not allowed to walk up and have a look and see what that is, but I'm guessing that's a 35 mil at 40, 45 yards. Here we have what looks like it a rat. So I'm guessing it's gonna be a 25 mil. The first thing we need to think about is wind. Pick up a leaf, have a little drop, and it seems to be coming towards us. I can feel on my face, I'm standing here, there's not a lot of wind on my right or to my left. We'll pick up the string. And again, there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of movement. So I'm guessing I'm gonna go straight at it. So we just, all, we just adjust the camera. Okay, so now let's have a look. Let's have a look at the target. We're not loaded yet. I always shoot my glasses off, as you know. Yeah, it's a 25 mil, and it looks like there's some people hit high, so they're thinking it's further away than it is. So we're gonna give it a little measure with the scope, just over 0.5 of a mil dot. Now I know that a scope, that a target, a 25 mil at 40 yards is 0.5. As this is fractionally over, I'm guessing this is around about 36, 37 yards. And also because people have hit high in the kill zone, sorry, high in the kill zone and, and high on the plate, it's not 40. So we'll check our little chart, 35 yards, and let's see what we can do. We're gonna put our 40 yard aim point Sorry, right at the bottom of the kill. So we're going to try and get as much in as we can. Head in perfect position. And there we go. Knocked it over, which is all good. Now, let's see. I know this isn't going to end well. Let's see if I am right. Give me a sec. I'll be back in a minute. Oh! It's cool. Now, I usually wouldn't have this on a course, but as we're bringing the course in, it will never be shot again. I don't have an issue with it. We've got a laser rangefinder. 
So let's see how accurate I was. I guessed around about 37 yards, 38 yards. So I'm happy with that. I wasn't completely off. So 25 mil, 38 yards. Okay, so we have a, an interesting target now. Um, it's a 15 mil, I think probably around about 20, 25 yards. But you have to shoot through the trees. Now, a lot of course setters do targets like this to draw your eye in into a tunnel effect to make the target look further away than it is. So it's going to be really important to have a look at the size of the kill zone and we'll bracket it. So let's have a look. Give it a measure. Okay, it's 0.6 of a mil dot, which shows me it's about 21 yards. Now, that's the little thing's folded over. So I know that I have to put my little top hat above the top of the kill, and that should go over. So let's give it a shoot. Now, this is my TX, so we're resting it on the ground. Cheek piece welded to the stock. Nice and tight. Now that's also interesting. Just below the kill zone, there looks like it's where the string carrier, um, where the string meets the, the plate. And it looks like someone shot it. And it looks like a false kill. Well, initially I did, my eye was immediately drawn to that. So you've got to be careful. Sometimes if you get a large blotch of pellets, you can sometimes think that the kill zone isn't where it is. So always make sure that you're looking at the correct kill zone. And if you're not sure, give the string a little wiggle and then you can make out where the kill zone is because you see the paddle flipping. Okay, so nice and solid, head in the center. And there we go, nice solid kill. People get scared of the 15 mils, but they really are your bread and butter of a shot because they don't take a huge amount of wind. Unless they're high up a tree and you've got elevation to worry about, they're the sort of target that you should just be mopping up. Um, so really practice, just drill in your accurate shooting and you'll never worry about a 15 mil. And actually, as I'm laying here, I've now feel that the wind is definitely starting to pick up and it's coming towards me. So we need to think about our next shot. Okay, so we're now at a target. I think it's around about eight to ten yards away. So it's important to have a look at the target and let's see what we can see. Well, the target for me is quite blurred. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw my head back. There you go, that's better. So it's a 20 mil. And unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a lot of history on it. Now, what I'll be doing is I'll be looking at the history. If there are lots of shots low, I know it's closer to eight yards. If there are lots of shot high, shots high, people have shot it eight and they'd have gone out the top. But this doesn't have a lot of history. So what does that tell me? Well, I know if I put my eye right up to the scope, I can, if it's eight yards, I can barely make out the kill zone. Whereas this, I can definitely make out the kill zone, but, but not the edges. So I'm going to draw my head back, head back, head back, head back. And now that I'm halfway down the buttstock, I can actually make out the edges a bit better. So that tells me it's 10 yards. If I go all the way to the back, it's 8. Here it's 10. If I'm right up at the top, it's nearer 12. So I check my chart. And 10 yards is one mil dot below the crosshairs. We're not going to worry about wind. Okay, so I'm looking through. And the other thing I need to check is to make sure there's nothing in line between here 
and the target because it's very, very close and I'm very low to the ground. Now, there are a few little twigs and bits around, but nothing directly in line. And there's no leaves or anything like that, so I'm good to shoot. The ground doesn't hasn't got a hump in it, so that should be okay. So I think it's just good to give it one mil dot and see how we go. Uh, it appears I got it wrong. Okay, so where did that hit? That looked like it hit slightly right. Give it another go. Like this. So what have I gone wrong? Missed again. I think that must be closer to eight yards. Doesn't look it. All right, let's have a third shot at it. And this time we'll shoot it at eight yards. <sighs> Interesting. So I used my blur technique to try and work out the range. Is it because today is a little bit duller and as such the the blur is wrong. There was no history on it. Yeah, there you go. That's just me getting it wrong. I do suck. Oh well, on to the next target and let's see if we can knock one over. Okay, so we're on our next peg, which is the kneel or stand. And this is a perfect example to show you why you always have to be very careful when you're moving around an HFT course. We'll just switch to the other camera. As you can see, we've had a rather large tree come down. So here we have the kneel or stand, and there's the target. So you wouldn't be able to stand it, but we will give it a go. Now in the past, we've had events where the organizers have taken a very tough decision to stop the event due to high winds, rain, subsidence, you know, whatever. Most, you know, a couple of the most famous of these have been the World Championships. I remember many years ago, I was at a shoot and a huge, great big branch fell out and it missed Ian Bainbridge by a couple of feet. If it hit him, you know, it would have absolutely crushed him. And it probably would have mean that he'd have been completely squished beneath it and he'd have had to have at least a few hours off work. Ian's a tough old soul. So this is why when you're moving around a course, you've got to watch out for rabbit warrens, tree stumps, trip hazards, a whole host of things. Look out for ticks if you're in an area that is particularly prone to ticks. It is a field sport. So when you're moving around, always watch around you and you know see if there's anything that could cause you harm. And if you see something, tell someone. I'll be reporting this particular tree to Richard and I'm sure he'll be down here with a chainsaw later on today. Um, so now we're going to have a go at Anila. Cheers. Now, our kneeling target, ow, is designated by a short peg. You've got to touch the peg with some part of your body. And what we're going to do is we're going to move back just a little bit, put our foot forward. We're kneeling on our rear foot and we're going to place our arm along the top of our leg. Now I'm in quite a lot of pain, so I'm going to shoot this quickly. And we miss just to the left. <sighs> practice your kneelers, practice your standers and... Uh, if you've got bad knees, try and get better knees. Now this is a really interesting target. First of all, do you remember what we said a minute ago? We've got these bits of twig, which are in front of us. Now, if it was say 10 feet in front of us and it had been fallen down from the trees, we can call a marshal and we can ask for them to be moved. 
if it's a large branch that's been put there deliberately to make you come up the peg, you can't do it. But if it's a piece of leaf or a, a twig or something that's fallen, you can ask for it to be moved. Now this is a spider's web. And resting on the ground, I can just about make out the kill. But between me and the target, there's a hump in the ground. And we'll show the point. I'll fire, aim at the target. I'm aiming directly at the target and I've hit the hump in the ground, zero. So what we're going to do, the target's out of 45 yards, it's the infamous spider's web of doom. I hate this target. And we're going to have to come up the peg. Arm down, butt in the crook of the arm, so you've still got some stability. And you notice up the peg I've changed my grip from my standard grip to my rotated grip as this works better when we're up the peg. I'm gripping the front of the hamster. Get in nice and tight to the scope. Oh, it's really uncomfortable. Okay, so. And there we go. Up the peg, 45 yards, no wind, the strings tied down so we couldn't check for wind left and right but I can feel it coming straight at me. So I aimed slightly above where I usually would. Hope that helps. This is why we're off having radio mics. Now I bought some and I put them on the side to set up because they take a bit of setting up. So they take a bit of setting up. My wife was tidying up because her mum and dad was coming round and uh, she can't remember where she put them. So there you go. Right, so um, standards and kneelers, supported standards and kneelers. Now, I take all my stuff standing. There's a couple of good reasons for that. Just let me get my gum. We're at the peg. And as you can see, I can pretty much we'll go onto the target and I can place my feet here. I can lean back a bit. I can come forward. I can come high. I can go to the other side of the peg. But as you can see here, the ground is sloping away, so if I was kneeling it, I'd have to worry about balance. Also, there's a huge great big root exactly where I want to kneel, and that's what you get with most trees. So, I initially did a test. Am I better at kneelers or standers? Well, I was slightly better at standers than I was, or supported standers than I was supported kneelers. But because of the huge advantage you get from standing, I wouldn't say I've completely ignored practice with my supported kneelers, but I spend way more time practicing my standers than I do my kneelers. And saying that, I'm probably going to miss the target. Okay, so 25 mil, about 30 yards. And yes, I did miss the target. I went left. <sighs> okay, excuse number 375. Whilst I'm filming this, I'm actually bringing the course in at Malden District, getting ready for the Southern Hunters. So I must admit, I'm a little bit tired because I've been up and down ladders. But that's my excuse, and I am sticking to it. Okay, control the breathing this time. Oh, wind's picked up. And there we go, we knocked it over. So that was due to incompetence, my incompetence, just sheer lack of talent, but we managed to knock it over. So strongly recommend practice your support with standards and it will benefit you in the long run. Okay, 
just take this opportunity to have a little talk about face plates. Right, we'll just swap the camera around. And here we have two targets. Now, do you see the difference in size of face plate? Now, there is a mini rat that looks identical to the rat on the left, but it's the size of the bird on the right. And the whole point of that is that a call setter will take a mini rat with a 20 mil kill and they'll put it in at say 27 yards and they'll use the tunnel effect to make you think it's further away so that when you lay down and you look at the target you think ah that's a long way away and then when you measure the kill zone you think okay that's 0.5 of a mil dot it's a long way away that means it's a 25 mil at 40 yards whereas it's a 20 mil at 27 yards so be aware there are face plates out there to catch you out. Really clever. Flopover.co.uk if you want to buy any. There's a saying, the best laid plans of mice and men. I knew Peg 25 was here because it's a great target. It's a 15 mil, it's 25 yards, it's high up in a tree. And it's a perfect target to explain what I want to do next. The problem is, I haven't allowed for some hungry rabbits who had chewed off the string. And to be perfectly honest with you, the ladder is so rickety, there is no way that I'm going to go climbing up there to reattach it. So, we'll discuss the target and I'll aim to shoot on the hinge or something like that. I won't bother filming it up there, but just to explain what we're doing. Now, we've all heard of the rifleman's rule. Um, if you haven't heard of it, go back and watch my video on elevated targets. Basically, if you're shooting above 45 degrees, having the ground at zero degrees, basically, if you're shooting so high that you're having to strain your neck all the way back, then the pellet is going to hit higher than you think it will. Now this is a 25 yard target. And then my microphone comes flying off. I think the Lord Almighty is trying to tell me not to shoot this target. Right. Maybe this is one of those final destination things. Everyone's telling me, don't do it, don't do it. The pellet's going to ricochet back, hit a branch, which is going to fall down, hit a fox. The fox is going to run over there, hit another branch, and then the plane's going to crash on the head. Right, okay, so we're aiming at the target. Now, if I was shooting a PCP, ooh, I can actually see the paddle, the way it's flopped back. I'm, I can actually see the paddle hanging below. I wonder if I can reset it. I've lost it. Where is it gone? No. No, that didn't work. Now, with a PCP, that's absolutely fine. There's no recoil. But with a Springer, a Springer always wants to recoil, even something like this, which has got very little recoil. But when we're going up at an angle, there's nowhere for it to recoil to if you're resting it on the deck like I usually do. So it's worth practicing a shot. When you're placing the butt of the rifle in your bicep. So we're also having to come up the peg, which isn't comfortable. So we're now in the bicep, trying to find the target. There's the target. It's a difficult grip. We're up the peg. It's in the bicep. The gun's got to recoil. I'm having to think about my rifleman's rule and the pellet is going to hit high. There's more wind up there than there is at the ground. I haven't had my lunch. I'm in a bad mood. And I've also got to think about making sure my head is absolutely central to the scope because my neck is bent back and not in my usual position. So, central, in the bicep, 
Apparently it's going to hit high. And a hit on the hinge where I wanted it to. So if the if the target had actually been up and I was able to aim at the kill, it would have gone down. This is one of the reasons why it's so important to be a member of a club. If you put a target up like this at home, you've got to think about if you miss it, where the pellet's going to land, is it going to leave your boundary? Whereas here at a club, you know, we've got plenty of targets up trees. Um, unfortunately, I've brought most of them in now because we're bringing the course in. And I really should have checked. But that's why it's so important. Be a member of a club and you can come out and practice like these to, to your heart's content. The rifleman's rule. Watch the video. Okay, so we're on to our final target. And this is quite an interesting one. It's a target that is underneath a, a load of branches. It, essentially, there's a little alcove being built down range to, to hide the kill zone. And what that's going to do is it's going to make it dark in there. Now, luckily, I'm using an Optisan CP, which is very, very good at gathering light. But what it will do is it will affect your blur. Now, I know that my scope is crystal clear at 40 yards. So let's have a look at this target. There's a little bit of blur there. So it's obviously 45 yards, isn't it? Isn't there? So what we'll do is we'll aim to the right hand side of the kill zone so we can see where the pellet mark hits. 45 yards according to the blur on the scope. Well, we've gone over the top. We, it looks like we've clipped it, but there's not even enough to put a mark on the plate. So that's 40 yards or even less. So that's what the blur has told us, because it's lying to us. And that's what it's designed to do. This is why blur can be great, but it can also lie to you. Okay, so we're now going to shoot it at 40 yards. And there we go. I put my 40 yards low in the kill zone, you know, to the right hand side of the kill zone so we can see where the pellet mark hits. It's 40 yards. The scope lied to me. And that is why these undercover targets work so well. So, just for a bit of fun, and this is our last target, it's always good to finish on a kill. I hope. We know it's 40 yards. Let's see if we can flop it over. And there we go. <sighs> Always good to finish on a kill. I'm so tired of picking this course in. Oh. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's video and our HFT walk around. Um, as I said, coming up soon, HFT walk around swimsuit edition, starring me, Rex and Jean. Should be wonderful. Um, I hope we've learned a bit. I know I've learned a bit. Um, I learn a bit every time I come out and shoot. Let me know what you want me to, you know, to look at. We're gonna we're gonna try and get a proper budget springer, something around about 150 quid. Something that somebody suggested, and I'd have to check with this and get permission and whatever, but would you be interested in seeing a vlog at an actual HFT competition? See if we can actually film whilst we're shooting, as, as long as we don't upset people. Let me know in the comments below. As ever, take care of yourselves, look after each other. It's really difficult doing this piece of camera and holding your stomach in at the same time because this shirt is, is fairly figure-hugging. Take care of yourselves and be excellent to one another. Ta-da.